we'll open your Bibles to Psalm 116. We'll look at verses 12 through 19. You'll notice the language in here of gratitude or thanksgiving, and that's why I picked it. This is still that last or that third section of the catechism. And before I read the passage, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you that you do hear us on account of your Son, Jesus, and as we are enabled by the Holy Spirit to come to you, to lift up our voices to you, and to pour out our hearts to you in all the ways that, by your grace, you're going to show us um, through the scriptures, through the use of these catechism questions and answers. I pray that we would take more seriously the discipline of prayer. I pray that you would help us and to, to deal with our hearts in the reasons that we do not, in our unbelief, in the hardness of our hearts, or in our willpower, our stubbornness, our lack of affection. I pray that you would deal with us in these areas and that you would graciously open up your word to us and help me to, to serve in that way, that we would be challenged and that we would be encouraged to come to you. Bless this study tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is called The Necessity and the Nature of Prayer, and I'm going to read Psalm 116, starting in verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So this portion of that psalm really captures that last theme, or sorry, the theme of the last section of the Heidelberg Catechism, and that is man's gratitude. And the section on the Lord's Prayer starts by defining prayer as the chief part, or the first part, or however the other translation said it, of that gratitude or that thankfulness. So question 116, why is prayer necessary for Christians? It says because it is the chief part of the thankfulness which God requires of us and because God will give his grace and Holy Spirit only to such as earnestly and without ceasing beg them from him and render thanks unto him for them. And then question 117 asks what belongs to such prayer as God is pleased with and will hear? First, that from the heart we call only upon the one true God who has revealed himself to us in his word for all that he has commanded us to ask of him. Secondly, that we thoroughly know our need and misery so as to humble ourselves before the face of his divine majesty. And thirdly, that we may be firmly assured that withstanding our unworthiness, he will for the sake of Christ our Lord certainly hear our prayer as he has promised us in his word. So the way I'm going to divide that is the first part is going to belong to that first question. The third part's going to go to the other question. And then the second part, I'm going to talk about an acronym that you might be familiar with, Marcy Sproul, about the elements of prayer. But those are covered in these two answers. So it really belongs to this as well. So here's how I'm going to break it up. First, we're going to see, see that prayer is how a Christian most vitally knows God. Secondly, prayer is ordained for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And we'll talk about that acronym when we get there 
acts, A-C-T-S, for those four words. And then thirdly, prayer is certainly heard by God on account of Christ. So let's look at the first point. First, prayer is how a Christian most vitally knows God. One definition of prayer, a very simple one, is communion with God. Communion with God. As R.C. Sproul puts it, one might pray and not be a Christian, but one cannot be a Christian and not pray. Prayer is to the Christian what breath is to life, yet no duty of the Christian is so neglected, end quote. So that's the first place we want to start here, is the basic definition. Communion, meaning personal relationship, which we all say in American Christianity that we're all about, a personal relationship with God. In his classic work on prayer, John Bunyan defines prayer in this way. He says, prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for such things as God has promised or according to his word for the good of the church with submission in faith to the will of God. That's a little bit wordier, but it takes into account all those uh, the, the Trinitarian aspect that, um, that these questions do as well. But the, the part that I put that in there for was what Bunyan meant by that whole sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart and soul to God. What he meant by that is that you simply lay bare all that which God already knows. And you know that God already knows. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount, that your Father in heaven knows. And that's one of the first practical questions we ask about prayer is, well, if he already knows, but, but the point is, is that we're pouring out. Like when any number of your emotions are really real, whether we're talking about anger, which is not always sinful, or fear, or bitter weeping, regret maybe, to fly to God about it, as a child would naturally fly to the side of his father or mother. That's what I think Bunyan means by pouring out the soul to God. Prayer is the Father's gift given to those in the Son. And that language is in these answers to the Catechism. It's the Father's gift given to the Son. Prayer is not a hearing offered to rebels to the King. The Bible talks about this, that God does not hear the prayers of the unbelief. Why would we expect prayer to be given as a superstition, as an insurance card or something like that, to people who are rebels to God? This is a general rule in Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So basic rule that forms a wall, he doesn't hear the unbeliever, those who are not in his son. But in addition to that, our sin can, can do things to affect our prayer life. And in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And you see that repeated in John 9, 31. It's just an assumption when they're in this conversation with Jesus. We know that God doesn't hear the prayers of, of the sinner. And um, so... The first question we want to ask practically is, if we're honest with ourselves, it's just sort of an experiment here about communion with God and personal relationship with God. If any one of us were to pick our top five most admired famous people, just think about that for a second. Whether we're talking about somebody throughout history or today, and for most, let's be even more honest, that would be actors and athletes. In other words, entertainers. And then to be told that we would have full personal access to them. To not only be their genuine friend, but to be known as such. And to have them wanting to do good things for us all the time. How excited would you be 
Hook yourself up to a lie detector test. Pretend you're not around other Christians right now and don't try to impress anybody. And just ask yourself, how excited would you be about that? How much effort would we put into securing that kind of access? How diligently would we look into whether that was really true? How we would pinch ourselves at finding out that it is true. How surreal, but actually how pathetic. And how revealing of our actual beliefs. But if we were honest, there are other people like that, just not so much God. But prayer is the Father's gift given to those in the Son to be all those things for real to us. Prayer is also made effectual by the Holy Spirit through our striving in it. The language in this answer talks about this being only for those who, and we could just use the word, strive for it. In one translation it says, who, who beg him for it. You know, like, what's that all about? This is really a paradox of the Christian faith. And it really parallels the same kind of thing in sanctification. See, we know that God's grace is what causes our salvation. It's a gift. We know this. It ultimately upholds us. And yet, the New Testament is filled with duties, conditions, warnings, promises of reward. It's not just the Old Testament. The New Testament speaks in the same way. And this causes many, many people to stumble. And likewise here with prayer. Prayer is a gift. And God doesn't need our counsel, by the way. Nor does God ever change his mind in the first place. So the questions come up, how can we speak of praying for some change? Or how can this catechism answer use the language of prayer gaining things only to those who earnestly and without ceasing beg them from him. Why would God even set that up that way if the whole thing is by grace and if he doesn't change his mind and doesn't need our advice? Well, the first answer we can give to that, and we'll give many answers to that as we go throughout the study and we look at different petitions of the Lord's Prayer, but the first answer we need to give to that is that this is biblical language. So whenever in doubt, what does Scripture say? Whenever you say, really? Ask yourself first, well, wait a minute, is this the way the Bible speaks? Because if it's the way the Bible speaks, then you, that has to be your first premise. The Bible has said so. And so, for example, Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, it says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And it's the same thing in Matthew 7, right? Ask, seek, knock. And that imagery of the woman who's knocking on the door, the impertinent lady, and, and that's a, called a good thing. That's a virtue. When you seek me with all your heart. Why? Well, step one, we'll give lots of answers for it. It's biblical language. God wants to build in us persistence in coming to him. Same thing with rest and the Sabbath in Hebrews 4, those strive to enter his rest, same thing. He's, he's building in us this passion for eternal relationship and life. First thing, the last thing I want to say about this first point is that prayer should not be a last resort when all else fails. I mean, think about it. If it's relationship with God, if, it's, if, if Sproul is right to say it's like breathing, for a living being, prayer is the same for us. Well, it can't be a last resort. When all else fails, we are to pray without ceasing, Paul says. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we can talk about all kinds of things that that means and doesn't mean. Pray without ceasing, so I have to close my eyes when I drive? No. <laughs> you ever run into that? When some, or if you ever struggle with it? Pray without ceasing, does that mean I, but I have to like listen to my class or talk to other people? I, I know, so there's all sorts of things that that doesn't mean and does mean, but certainly constancy is there. But to come to God only when all else fails is to say to God that all else was the gain that you were hoping for. But since your real treasures didn't pan out, and you can always fall back on God, that's what we're saying. 
when we treat prayer in that way. And the Lord does not regard such prayers, as we see through Hosea in Hosea 7.14. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves. They rebel against me. So if people were under judgment there, what they do? They waited till midnight. And they said, well, nothing else worked, so I guess we'll try God. Or nothing else satisfied. So maybe God will. And you may have to learn those things the hard way in life, but that's not prayer, and that's not personal relationship with God. You cannot expect an audience with God in his judgment that you wanted no part of in the days of his mercy. Now, on a corporate level, on a kingdom level, it really just shows our puny little brains and shriveled hearts to miss the place that God has given to prayer. When I say that, I'm preaching to myself too. It shows how small our vision is for the kingdom of God, for the church and how things move in this world. To not, I mean, have we ever read Acts chapter six or Ephesians six or Romans eight? Do you not know that prayer is that second pillar, that second job description of the ministry of the word, right along with the ministry of the word that's given to elders, right? So when they created deacons, it's because elders had to get to the ministry of the word and prayer. Or that prayer is that last and summary weapon going before the full armor of God in Ephesians 6. And that it is the prayer of the saints that fill the bowl of incense in the courts of heaven in, Ro in Revelation 8. And that's a, an incredible picture in Revelation 8. That lightning that God uses to have the angels throw down like a divine hypersonic missile down into history's atmosphere. It's filled, the, the stuff they pack into that lightning that they're gonna throw down from heaven to change all of the main events of history is made up of the prayers of the saints. You ever thought about prayer that way? What moves things in history? Well, materially, if you want to say it that way, the prayers of the saints that God uses. So that's just a basic picture and our first point of what prayer is. Secondly, prayer is ordained for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Now, we're going to follow an acronym here, four letters. I get this from R.C. Sproul, and you may be familiar with it. ACTS, A-C-T-S. And I use it because I think it's true, and I think it's very useful. And it stands for those four elements of prayer. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, and four for supplication. And in one form or another, that's all here in these catechism answers. So let's look first at A, adoration in prayer. That means devotion or worship in prayer. Think about it. If doing theology should be worship, if serving the weak or the giving of our tithes are all to be offered up as acts of worship, well then, why wouldn't prayer be the same? And that might seem like the most foreign element, I think it is, to prayer. I don't know. Um, maybe it's not for some people, but for a lot of people, you might think like that seems weird or perhaps old fashioned or whatever it is. But going back to that whole last resort thing, anybody can pray with the barbarians at the gates. But David praised with barbarians at the gate. He was a warrior, he was a king, he was charged with that sort of stuff. So the people didn't have to worry about it. And when he was in the wilderness, he penned Psalm 63. And the first verse says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's when he was on the run. That's when he was in the wilderness. That's when he was just him and his soldiers. And what was he thinking about? That he longs for God and his presence. 
Psalm 18, that song about the Lord being his rock and his fortress. A lot of military language in that psalm, but it begins in the first words, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And then he starts talking about, you know, the, the arrows for war and stuff like that. But it starts out with, I love you, O Lord, my strength. David recognized that God is always drawing out what glorifies him in the very things that terrify us. The things that are hard in this life are the things that he draws up as worship to himself. But speaking of the psalmist, it might be that adoration is the one element most absent from our prayers because we're starved of the everyday vocabulary, the language that's used to give worship its wings. And I'm speaking of things like poetry and narrative and song. And the Reformed worship does have an advantage here. We, we have these Trinity Psalters. We sing psalms. And so there's an advantage that Reformed worship has in cultivating the language of adoration. Not to say that we don't have our own pitfalls or that therefore we're not going to struggle with it for other reasons. But at least it teaches us that language because the soul never rises above its speech. And we're a very, very pragmatically speaking people in America. We, we just want the technical details. We want the steps, just the facts, ma'am. And by the way, make it quick. I'm in a hurry, and that's how we pray, and that's how we talk. And if it's how we talk, then we're not going to have the language of adoration. And another objection people, you know, maybe this is sort of in here and it prevents us from adoration is, well, surely God does not need us to tell him about himself, right? But I feel kind of silly telling God how great he is. Doesn't God know how great he is? And he knows I'm a hypocrite for having just thought of it and trying just to mix it into my prayer. Well, that's true. But neither does he need our counsel. And yet there we are, ready to barge ahead with all of our wish lists. So it doesn't stop us from asking him for favors. And so that sin and finitude on our part, us being bad worshipers, shouldn't stop us from worship. Because that's not why we worship, because of how wonderful we worship. We worship on the ground of Christ and his righteousness and then how great God is. In adoration, we are undergoing change from worrier to worshiper. We are setting the tone for the rest of the prayer. I always tell people, just open up the Psalms. What do I do? I don't know what to say. Which, by the way, the Bible addresses that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when in doubt, just open up the Psalms. And what's in there? Songs, worship, praise, poetry, all in deep theology about God. It's exactly what you need. You know, and not just that, it's not just what you need for worship, it's what you need to, to have your soul be represented to God. Calvin said that the Psalms are an anatomy of the whole soul. In other words, there's no part of human emotions or human experience that God has not given to us to sing about or, or through, even, even when we're bummed out, even when we're hopeless, there's Psalm 89, you know? And so there's no part of how you, but I'm not feeling it. There's a psalm for that. It's like there's an app for that. There's a psalm for that. So when in doubt, open up the psalms and start there. Secondly, there's the C, confession. Confession in prayer means turning from sin with my words. And people struggle with that too, doesn't it say? For example, Psalm 139 verse 4 even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And by the way, I thought Jesus already paid it all. Well, all of our sins are already forgiven. Well, that's true too. But confession forces us to not grow numb to the daily reality of our sin and how that naturally hardens us and forms an obstacle to our affections being brought before God. That's what we mean when we say, I'm not feeling it today, meaning you just sit. 
But I'm ashamed. And we're a little bit more honest there. What's happening there? Sin. Yes, he has objectively forgiven you. He's objectively dealt with sin. But our problem is in the subject. We keep sinning. And that has an immediate effect on us. So he says to Christians in 1 John 1, 9, to Christians already forgiven, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by the way, he says there to the perfectionists, if anyone says he has no sin, he's a liar. And down further, he says he makes God out to be a liar. So we still sin, therefore we still experience shame and a bucket of cold water thrown on our affections to God. Confession recognizes the other side of that coin, that prayer is a gift of God. You know, what's the other side of that coin, that prayer is a gift from God? Well, it's simply that if that's true, what that means is I have absolutely no right to come before God at all. No right, but for Christ. Confession makes the gospel front and center in prayer. And it's natural after adoration. We focus on the greatness of God, and in seeing the greatness of God, we see how sinful we are. And so we make a beeline for the gospel. And we remember, it's because of Christ. And that brings us to thanksgiving, the T. Thanksgiving in prayer is what this whole section's all about, gratitude. And so we use our words for gratitude when we really mean it. If we're thankful people, if we really are, we'll use our words. You know, what sort of conversations would a child expect to have with their father or mother at night if that child has done nothing but complain all day long? Even the classic Paul verse on prayer, Philippians 4, 6, on requests, it says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That's another question to ask yourself. Well, it doesn't seem like God's answering my prayers. Well, are they really just grumblings? So that might be something to think about. But this whole idea of thanksgiving totally reorients our soul. I'm sure you've heard the saying before that it's harder to be mad at somebody when you're praying for them. Well, it's the same thing here. It's harder to be sour and cynical and grumbling when we count those many blessings. As Psalm 103, 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So we should, first of all, be thankful for the basics. We should be thankful for life. He didn't have to make us. And we should be thankful for the new life. He didn't have to give us faith. That faith that can pray, that faith that can believe in the gospel and all the benefits that come from its giver. Ursinus, the uh, author of this catechism, uh, said about praying for faith, he talked about Thanksgiving there. He says, faith is neither kindled nor increased in anyone who does not desire or ask it. He says, no one has faith who is not thankful for it? Well, stop right there. This is one of the signs of conversion. Is my faith real? Well, let me ask you this. Are you thankful for it? That's what your scientist is saying. No one who has faith uh, is not thankful for it. For all those who are possessed of true faith taste the grace of God. And those who have tasted of the grace of God show themselves thankful to God for it and desire it more and more. You know, you're not going to go to God for more and more of something that you don't believe he had anything to do with to begin with, right? If you were a consistent Arminian, you wouldn't be thanking, you, or sorry, you wouldn't, well, you wouldn't, that's the system, you're not thanking God for that, but, but you wouldn't be praying to God to, to give the gift of faith, okay? So theology matters here. Fourthly, there's the S, the A-C-T-S. S is supplication, and that means request. And nobody doubts that the Bible teaches that prayer is this, as we just heard in Philippians 4, 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So don't swing to the other extreme if you hear later on in the course of this series that are you praying in the will of God? 
Are you praying what his will is? Are you expecting only what his will is? Do you preface it? Do you say, if it be your will, and so forth? Well, don't fly to the other extreme and think that, therefore, we are not to ask him. Because he tells us to ask him. We need to concentrate on an important distinction here. I'm going to get a little bit theological for a second here, but we have to. Prayer does not change God's mind. And prayer does absolutely change things. Let me repeat that, because that's pretty important. Because then, wait a minute, if it doesn't change, what you just said, what? No, listen to the whole thing. Prayer does not change God's mind. And, I don't even like to say but, as if they're two different things. I want us to get this so well that we realize, well, yeah, that goes together. I can see how both, yeah. Okay, so one side, prayer does not change God's mind. And prayer does absolutely change things. I don't have a chalkboard, but just everybody look here. Big circle, God's decree. God has ordained from before the foundations of the earth to change a bunch of things. Small circle now. Small circle inside that circle. He uses all sorts of secondary causes. One of them's prayer. Pascal even says that, he's wrestling with this, that God lends to us prayer. God gives us prayer to lend to us the the gift of causality or something like that, or the intelligibility of it. He's a mathematician. That's why he said it that way. But what, what he was saying is big circle, little circle. God ordained everything that comes to pass. He uses all sorts of means. Evangelists, pastors, parents, words, books, near-death experiences, and prayers, the prayers of the saints. So prayer doesn't change God's mind. Prayer does change things. The reason, let's go big circle here, the reason that prayer cannot change God's mind, I'm not just saying it doesn't change his mind, prayer cannot change God's mind is because of a couple of big attributes here. The divine essence is wholly, three things that are relevant here, immutable, unchangeable. So not just it doesn't change, cannot change. The divine mind is wholly omniscient, knows all things, can't learn any new thing. If he learned a new thing, he wouldn't know all things in his eternal mind. So I'm not teaching him anything? <laughs> right? Nobody would say that, but, but that's what it would imply. He cannot change his mind. He cannot learn anything new. And then in fact, number three, God is impassable, which is to say he cannot be affected. Passio in the Latin just means to suffer. In the divine essence, he cannot suffer any change from outside of himself. He is not in any sense an effect. His will 